So we want to welcome everyone. We have something exciting to share about the microbiome today. Exciting for me to learn. <laughs> we were listening to Zach Bush in a talk that we'll share with you a short clip of in a moment. And he talked about why we have such an epidemic, at least the way I heard it, in North America today of obesity. When we feed our body salt, oil, sugar foods, which all the processed foods are, the, we create a microbiome that asks for more of those foods. And that creates poor health, that creates all kinds of inflammation and all of the major conditions that we're dealing with today. Conversely, when we make the shift to whole food plant-based and begin to eat the foods the body thrives on to have great health, it asks for more of those. So everybody we worked with, we noticed after they've been eating whole food plant-based for a very short time, a week to two weeks, they lose all their cravings for the processed foods, the foods that are inflammatory that create the poor health that we're experiencing today unnecessarily. So we wanna share with you this clip that gives a lot more information about how the microbiome asks for how it's populated. And it's populated by the foods that we eat. So what you're saying is that if we eat processed foods, junk food and that, that those types of foods actually encourage a different group of microbes, a different microbiota, a different microbiome than when we eat the high nutrient dense foods. If we eat the high nutrient dense foods, there's a very different population yes, exactly. of microbes. And that there's a relationship between the microbiome and our hunger response, our, our, what we're drawn to to eat because whatever that population is currently, it asks for more of what it prefers. Yeah. So if we have junk food microbes in our guts, it's naturally gonna send a signal actually to our brains yeah. to eat for Which explains the craving mm. for junk that I, people don't even really want. Mm. Their bodies certainly don't even mm. eat begin to educate the body how it can thrive with whole food, plant-based, high-nutrient food. Yeah, and another thing that he touches on just briefly is how the high-fat, high-sugar, high-salt foods um, not only create a certain microbiota so that we're drawn to, we're drawn to eat more of that food, those are the foods that create a dopamine hit in the brain. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah, they're like a cocaine hit. A cocaine hit too, so yeah. But the beauty is that the body is designed to regenerate and it knows the difference actually between thriving and not thriving. And so once we uh, give ourselves some guidelines and begin to move toward high nutrient dense foods, like Connie says, the microbiota changes and the cells in the body really wake up and go, give me more of that. Yeah. So let's have more kale today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're going to play this clip. I just want to give a little bit of a context around something that they mentioned earlier in the talk that we weren't going to include. I'll just briefly summarize it. There was research done in the 1930s by a group of pediatricians in an orphanage. And they started with children at six months of age and tracked them until they were six years old. And what they did is they put out different foods every day for them to choose from. It was kind of like a buffet. And they had 27 different foods they could choose from. They could have whatever they wanted, however much they wanted. And what they found was quite interesting that the children never ate the same thing twice, one meal after another or one day after another, they were always drawn to have this wide variety of food. And the other thing uh, that they noticed was that these kids were the healthiest, both physically and mentally, 
of any group of kids they'd ever seen. Yeah, that is amazing, especially since they didn't have two loving parents. Yeah. They had no loving parents. Yeah, so even in this kind of difficult social setting, you might say, they were very mentally stable. And they could only attribute it to the fact that they were allowed to eat what their bodies drew them to. So that we love to hear because it gives such uh, accreditation, if I say, to one of the tenets in our program that's so important to us that you want to listen to your body. That there is that intelligence right there, just that these kids just express for the first six years of their lives. We know what to eat, we know what the body thrives with. And if we aren't subjected to a lot of things that give us dopamine hits and disturb the microbiota, uh, we do naturally uh, tend toward high nutrient dense foods. Let's listen to Zach. Okay, here we go. I think reintegrate the human experience into that natural state that you describe in those children in the 1930s, which is the microbiome wants diversity, in, in its own ecosystem, as well as the nutrients that would feed that eco ecosystem. And we know that those bacteria are very good at manipulating our behavior. And so if, if you've gone and trained your, your gut into eating fat, salt, sugar combinations, you've now refined your gut microbiome into this very narrow s spectrum of bugs that are forcing you to eat more of that because that's what they eat. Yeah. And so when you have an antibiotic exposure, and you collapse you know, some 80% of your biodiversity in two weeks of antibiotics, you just lost the intelligence of that balanced ecosystem. And now you just have a few weed-like organisms that are calling for what they want, which is likely to be some of the more noxious stuff out there because they are the weeds. That's what weeds do. Weeds are very good at dealing with detoxification and getting you know, junk processed out of your body that shouldn't be there. Well, if your dominant species process junk, no problem eating more junk. And it's very likely that they'll keep you know, sending signal of like, yep, I can deal with that, I can deal with that. And they're, they're, they're not encouraging you to shift that nutritional course. And we see this in even bizarre cases of like transplants, you the liver transplant or kidney transplant, and the, the recipient can wake up on the table with different food preference. You changed a solid organ and they wake up with a different food preference. Yeah. How is that possible? Well, we now are finding out that every organ in our body is full of bacteria of yep. some sort or another, or is working in concert with different species of bacteria. Which it, creates a memory, right? And there's a memory order. to that, yeah. yeah. And so suddenly the woman wakes up on the operating table or in the, in the recovery unit, and she's craving chicken nuggets for no reason, except that the guy who just donated that kidney who died last week was hit on his way to McDonald's to get his chicken nuggets. And that has been well documented in multiple cases now that that food preference is memorized by that, that internal organ and its relationship to the microbiome that would be you know, providing nutrients for that organ. And so it's just this bizarre realization of, wow, we, when we go and screw with the ecosystem through, you know, I think really antibiotics are, are ground zero of our health epidemic, and not just antibiotics from the doctors, antibiotics in our food production system, you know, all the way down to our soil treatment with glyphosate and Roundup, which acts as an antibiotic. We start screwing with that biodiversity. We have no idea what we're doing to the water structure, the memory, the intelligence of the organ systems to such that they're now ungrounded. They don't remember what health feels like or what would have gotten them to health. The kidney can't remember what it would, would take it to kidney health. And so it just starts doing damage control and it's now living in a moment to moment fight or flight state. Mm -hmm. The whole organism now in a fight or flight state and you see the human behavior towards its food that we have today, which is, as you mentioned, the Red Bulls, you know, the caffeine mm -hmm. stimulus, the Starbucks phenomenon. We literally have coffees mm -hmm. now that are 850 calories. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's like <laughs> that was a whole meal back in the day. <laughs> right. And now you get that in your little you know, 16 ounce cup. And not to mention there's all the microplastics and everything else and weirdness. Like it, it, the, the, the situation we've created in sh such a short period of time is staggering in its errors, but encouraging that it is such a short period of time. Yeah. We don't have to go back to some paleo era 
you know, man to figure out what they were eating. We just need to figure out what the kids in the 1930s were eating, <laughs> yeah. yeah, not too far back. Well, I can imagine those kid, kids today, uh, so, so those kids in the 1930s were provided this incredible, bountiful buffet every day, right? You know, multiple fruits, vegetables, meats, whole grains, all of this. But I would imagine that the vast majority of kids today, that if we laid out that same buffet with those same items, would look at that table and say, where's the pizza and the Doritos? No question, because again, it's, it's partly the kid's behavior, but it's more the kid's drug effect is, is re not seeing anything that's gonna stimulate dopamine on that table. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and the, and the brain of that child has never experienced, literally, because it's been three generations now since we could experience it, that that kid has no way of knowing, the brain of that child has no way of knowing that the, the tomato that was just grown in that regenerative soil has lycopene in there. And when you experience lycopene coming into the intestinal environment, you get this huge anti-inflammatory effect and a huge kind of burst of kind of new information across the immune system and everything else. The kid doesn't know that. At the biologic level, there's no memory of that. There's no you know, experience therein. And so this is why when we're teaching adults are more difficult to shift than children, but teaching an adult or a child how to eat again you have to remind them that you, you need to expose your body repeatedly to a Brussels sprout or kale or a tomato and, and reteach your, not just your taste buds, but your immune system, the enzyme pathways that would get that bioavailable medicine of the alkaloids out of that tomato or whatever it is. You have to do that multiple times. And so our, our rough estimate is somewhere in that seven to 14 times of consumption, your body now learns that pathway memorizes that and says, okay, today I wake up and I have some inflammation in my back because I overdid it yesterday, or I didn't sleep enough and so I need some stimulation of dopamine here. To do that, I need not a drug, I need something with phenylalanine and tyrosine and these important amino acids and I'm gonna take that from that food because I remember when I ate that food, I got that in the brain a couple hours later. And so the organism is super intelligent, just like those children demonstrated in the 1930s, of knowing what it needed at that moment. And there is no two moments alike. Your body is always ready for something different and, and in need of something different than the moment before. And so I'm very excited by this, this farm to table movement that we have. We're starting to see fruits and vegetables show up on, uh, on grocery store shelves that haven't been there in decades. The daikon radish may be a good example of this. You know, that giant thing looks like a giant white carrot. And people walk by that thing all the time in the grocery store, and brain doesn't even like register that it's there because it has no idea what that thing is. It just that looks confusing and large and a pain in the neck to chop up. When in reality, there's you know, critical nutrients from many of these root vegetables that have been devoid, but it's showing up and people are starting to talk about it. And, you know, morning talk shows are starting to talk about, you know, arugula and, you know, all, all of this stuff is starting to filter back into the day-to-day -day experience of the consumer, which means that we're, you know, starting to crack that, that, you know, black box that has been nutrition through just exposure. We just need to be exposed like that child who stares at that, that table of the 1930s and says, I have no idea what's going on there. Exposure, 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 and in a very short period of time, you know that if that kid was put in that environment every day and given no other choices, within a month, they would be the healthiest they've ever been, period. And I've seen that happen again and again. If I change the nutritional environment, I can take people who have been suffering decades, four, seven, eight decades of decline, and within three months, they're experiencing physiologic function in their body that they literally didn't experience 20 years ago. And so that's the speed and the, and the, and the capacity of the human biology is to say, let's go beyond this degenerative state and go into a regenerative biology, if it happens in the soil, it's gonna happen in the plant, it's gonna happen in the human, and we're gonna see life emerge from this decaying, kind of destructive, yeah. consumptive, health slash disease environment we're currently in. So, there you have it. What I wanna encourage you to do is to explore more of what Zach is sharing. He is so knowledgeable and has such a broad vision of how we can live a healthier life and longer life than what we may think is possible. So 
How you find out more about Zach is go on to Zach Bush MD, and there are all kinds of educational videos that you'll enjoy very much. Thanks so much for joining us in food today. It's another quick and easy meal, and it's using things in a plastic tub like the power greens and some of the baby spinach leaves and corn and peas and pumpkin seeds. It sounds strange, maybe. It takes minutes to prepare. It is a great dish that gives you a one dish meal. One dish meal, it tastes great and uh, there's no prep, no washing, no prep or anything. So, I mean, it goes on the stove in minutes and it just takes a few minutes to cook. So you can be eating roughly 10, 12 minutes from the time you start cooking. To your amazing health and connect with us below if you want to give us any comments or ask any questions. We're here for you. All right. Bye.